This week, The Telegraph published another misleading story claiming that scientists are tampering with the historical temperature record. In this video, I'm going to take a look at some of the claims in the new story. But more importantly, I want to show you some tools that you can use to evaluate this kind of claim for yourself. Scientific claims are evaluated on the basis of the evidence. So let's start with the data. Raw global weather station data are available from three sources. Firstly, the Global Historical Climatology Network, or GHCN, managed by NOAA. Secondly, from Berkeley Earth, an independent project. And thirdly, from the International Surface Temperature Initiative. Each of these projects provides both the original, unadjusted weather station data and the results of their retrospective recalibrations. You can download the data and compare them. They also provide all the software that they use to do the recalibration calculations. You can download these and run them for yourself. So you don't have to trust the scientists, you can check for yourself. NOAA and Berkeley also provide detailed graphical analysis of the calibrations they have applied to the data. The NOAA calibrations are described in a set of reports, one for each weather station. These are accessible through this page. These folders represent different continents. Inside each folder are the reports for individual weather stations, named according to the code number for that weather station. Let's take a look at an easy case. This is the report for Kursk. Top right are the raw data. While the data looks sensible for most of the record, we can see some suspicious big jumps in the 1960s. Next are the recalibrated data. The big jumps have gone. The year-to-year -year variation is now fairly consistent throughout the record. At the bottom is a chart of the calibration applied to each year of the data. We can clearly see the points where recalibrations have occurred. The calculation doesn't just look for jumps. It looks for inconsistencies between neighbouring stations. If just one station stands out as different from all its neighbours over a particular period, the calculation works out how to recalibrate the outlier. Here are two neighbours of the problem station. Neither of these show big jumps. With the Kursk adjustments, the three stations agree very well. The NOAA station reports contain a lot of information, but you need to know the code numbers for the stations to find the report you're looking for. To make finding reports easier, I've created a graphical station browser, which you can use to flip between reports. The address is given in the video description. The latest claims in the Telegraph concern adjustments to Arctic weather stations in relation to sea ice decline. So let's take a look at the Arctic stations. Of course you can show anything you want if you get to pick which stations you look at. So instead, let's look at all of them. I took both the unadjusted and the adjusted data from NOAA and took the difference between them in order to determine the adjustments. Then I plotted the trend in the adjustments over the last 50 years for all the stations in the Arctic, grouped by grid cell. Here's a map of the trends. Green is no adjustment, blue represents downward adjustments which cooled the record, and red represents upward adjustments which increased the amount of warming. As you can see, NOAA have been systematically adjusting stations in the high Arctic, but they've been adjusting them downwards, suppressing the warming trend. That's exactly the opposite of the claim in the Telegraph. And if we look at Iceland, we see no adjustment at all. That's odd. Let's look at some of the Iceland stations. Many of them do indeed show upward adjustments, but these were back in the 1960s, before the onset of the late 20th century warming. So let's look at the trend in the adjustments over a longer period, a hundred years. Now we see the warming adjustments over Iceland, but the Arctic as a whole is still dominated by cooling adjustments. The telegraph is wrong, you can't blame Arctic warming on the station adjustments. 
but are the Iceland adjustments correct? We'll come back to that question. Let's look at another tool. Berkeley Earth provide an interactive interface to their data which we can use both to compare the Berkeley adjustments with those from NOAA and to find out why the adjustments have been made. Here is the record for Sao Paulo in Brazil. Berkeley show us the raw data for that station. It shows very rapid warming, more than 3 degrees in a century. But Berkeley then work out the average of all the other stations nearby and calculate the difference between this station and the regional average. We can see some clear jumps. It looks as though there have been some changes at the station. The red line shows what Berkeley think are the impact of the station changes. The green lines show when the changes occur. In some cases there's a red diamond on the line. This is a documented station move when we'd expect the calibration to change. In other cases there is a black square which means that there's a clear change in calibration but no record of why. The final record for Sao Paulo is shown here in red and shows a much more modest warming trend. The regional average is shown by the blue line and shading. The agreement between Sao Paulo and its surrounding stations is now pretty good, although there is one remaining problem in the 1950s which may have been missed. In my previous video we looked at a station in Paraguay, Puerto Casada. Here is the Berkeley Earth page for that station. Again, the difference between the station record and the regional average shows very clear jumps. In this case, there are documented station moves corresponding to the two jumps. There may be another small change here which wasn't picked up. The picture for this station is actually fairly clear. Isolated stations, like the ones in the Antarctic, are of course much more difficult. If we take a look at the Berkeley adjustments for Iceland, they look a bit different to the ones from NOAA. Berkeley don't introduce the big adjustments in the 1960s. Who's right? And does it make a difference? The first of these is unresolved at this stage, but our next tool can help with the second. The third tool I'd like to look at is one of my own. This allows you to calculate your own version of the temperature record, so that you can experiment with different data and different calculation methods. It's more sophisticated than the tool I showed you in my previous video. In particular, it can calculate a combined land-ocean temperature record, which is the normal way in which we measure global warming. With it, you can reproduce the Met Office temperature record well, and by changing the calculation options, you can also get a good approximation to the NASA record. The address is provided in the video description. To calculate a global temperature record, we need to provide two files from NOAA, the station inventory and the station data. You will need to download and unpack these in advance. Next, we provide the sea surface temperature data, downloaded from the Met Office. Finally, hit calculate. The calculation takes a little while. We can see the progress in this bar here. In this case, we use the adjusted data from NOAA. The results are shown by the heavy line. I previously did the same calculation with the unadjusted data, shown by the light line. The difference over the last 50 years is very small. You have to smooth the data to really see any difference. If we look at the trends, the difference is about 3%, or 2% if we use the NASA options. However, over the whole record, the difference is bigger, a little over 10%. This is unsurprising. The further back in time we go, the more measurement practices have changed. There is a real scientific question here, though. While calibrations to individual stations may be upwards or downwards, the effect on global temperatures, while rather small, has tended to be upwards. If the changes were random, then that would indicate a bias. But the changes are not random. There have been systematic changes to weather station, location, equipment and operating practices over time. 
I've included a few relevant papers in the description. These changes are sufficient to explain the trend in the station adjustments. To establish that there is a problem with the calibration calculations, it would first be necessary to demonstrate why the weather station changes are not biasing the observations. This logical step seems to be missing from much of the discussion so far. But even if we throw away the adjustments, the big picture doesn't change enough to make a difference. So this whole argument is not about the science, it's an attempt to distract attention away from it.